Lily Chu is leading the way in a new approach to publishing, launching her best-selling books in audio first and then following up with print a few months later, and it's certainly working for her. Her whip-smart, funny rom-coms have been top of both Audible and Apple bestseller lists in 2021 and 2022. Welcome to the joys of binge reading, the show for anyone who ever got to the end of a great book and wanted to read the next instalment. We interview successful series authors and recommend the best in mystery, suspense, historical and romance series, so you'll never be without a book you can't put down. You'll find this episode's show notes, a free ebook, and lots more information at thejoysofbingereading.com. And now, here's our show. Hi there, I'm Jenny Wheeler, your host, and today, Toronto-based rom-com author Lily talks about her latest book, The Comeback. It introduces readers to the global phenomenon of K-pop music, and I can tell you the book is certainly a delight. The introduction to K-pop, fascinating. When Ari comes home from a long day at her law firm to find an unfamiliar, gorgeous man camped out in her living room, life as she knows it begins to change, especially when she discovers the man in question is South Korea's hottest K-pop star. That's coming up next. But first, to the all-important matter of three books, which we have every episode. And as usual today, two book offers. First, the chance to go into a drawer to win a library of wine and dine read, plus an e-reader to go along with them, $550 in value. That's more than 50 books. And you can also stock up on free historicals for the next season, whether it's for the beach or for in front of the fire, depending on where you live. Details for where to enter those contests, plus all the information relating to the episode, where to find Lily's books and her social media contact can be found on the show notes for this episode at thejoysofbingereading.com. But now here's Lily. Hello there, Lily, and welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us. Hi, thanks for having me. Look, The Comeback, which is the book we're particularly talking about today, is your second rom-com, and it follows closely on the first, which was called the stand-in, and that was really a tremendous success for a debut novel. Did you suffer that nerve thing of having a major success for your first book and feeling inadequate about getting to grips with the second? How did that go for you? I generally feel inadequate, so that wouldn't be a new feeling. Thank you for client success. I'm so happy people are enjoying the stand-in. I hope they enjoy the comeback just as much. But, you know, it's interesting you should say that because I was actually writing a lot of the comeback as I was editing the stand-in. So it hadn't really hit because the way publishing is a weird world in the way that it does its timing. By the time the stand-in came out, I think I was probably well into edits on the comeback. So I was still in that same mindset. Yeah, actually, I thought much to myself that might have been the case. So you didn't have that burden of having a first success and, oh, heck, how am I going to do it again? And the two books have quite a few similarities in their subject matter. So we'll get on to that a little bit later. But in the comeback, Ariadne, or Ari as she's called, meets a famous K-pop Korean star, Korean pop star. But he's incognito. She doesn't actually understand at the beginning who he is. She just meets this guy who's her cousin's friend. And they form a very close friendship before she realizes who he is. I hope we're not producing too many spoilers here but but you have to go into it a little bit to get the story tell us where that actual the whole nub of the story came from yeah I don't think it is a spoiler to I think it's actually right in the blurb the reason that I had to give them some time together is because I wanted the funniness and the drama of the realization so it's a totally different experience if she had known who Jihoon was right from the get-go versus getting to know this guy falling in love with this guy And then finding that this guy is actually a very different kind of guy. So I wanted to set that up, but I didn't want them to get so far down the relationship path that the reveal is, whoa, she really should have said something earlier. Because that to me is not, I don't like books necessarily where relationships are founded on cheating or lies or anything that builds mistrust. Those aren't my favorite 
kinds of books. So I wanted to make sure that they knew each other as people and enjoyed each other as people before she got out who she was. Yes. And the development of their relationship in the early days is very sweet. It's like a close friendship. They're very much circling around one another. You can sense that the interest they have in one another is very deep. But as you say, they don't actually express any of that at all. And she does feel a bit betrayed when she discovers who he really is. She's still got a real opportunity to pull back and not feel that she's committed to anything under false pretenses, doesn't she? Yes, I don't want to get the spoilers, but I feel the scene where they kind of talk it out. It's one of my favorite scenes. Now I do want to talk about it, but I'm not going to. I think when you find out kind of everyone's role, it becomes much more understandable of what went on. Yes, exactly. Now she is a dedicated lawyer. And at the beginning, you feel really quite sorry for her because she's totally in the clutches of her father's ambition on her behalf. And she is just working her butt off to keep her parents happy, well, particularly her father, happy and meet his expectations. She hardly has a life of her own at all. Is this a fairly typical pattern in Korean or Chinese or even Asian families? I'm thinking of the tiger mother thing, but often this generation feels they have to live up to parent expectations, don't they? It wasn't like that in my family, and I would hate to put a generalization on families based on, you know, where their parents or grandparents came from. I will say in Ari's specific family, she herself at the beginning wants to be a lawyer. Like those are, she feels also that those are her dreams. It's not that she is kind of completely under her father's thrall and her only goal is to make him happy. That's part of it for sure. But she herself is the one who made the choices to go to law school and become a lawyer. And she wants to be the best. Like she wants to be the best lawyer she can be also for herself. And it's only kind of as she's learning more about herself that she starts to wonder like, hold on, like everyone in this field does these kind of hours and does this kind of dedication, but is that really what I want as an individual? Yeah, that's great. And Jehoon is a pop star, but very different. The Korean model is very different from what we might consider the Mick Jagger kind of pop star, isn't he? Tell us a bit about the K-pop model and how they train up to be this great star. Yeah, so K-pop or Korean pop music, it's a genre that's been around for about 30 years or so. It's very recognizable. And what really sets it apart is unbelievably incredible stage values. The production values are just extraordinary. Like when you watch a K-pop performance, it's mind-blowing the amount of work and effort that goes into it and just truly overwhelming it is. There's a lot of synchronized singing and dancing and there's in-house studio production and the K-pop idols. So they're, you know, where we would say rock stars, the term there is idol. They are trained up kind of with their agencies and, you know, they're taught how to sing, how to dance, comportment, languages sometimes, like all sorts of things that I think, you know, wouldn't even cross our radar in North America to train a pop star. And I think we come from a much more organic, I guess, mindset when it comes to music. But this is much more of a finding talent and training up that talent situation. Yes, the rock music scene in the West has been one which was bedded in revolt against standard values, I suppose. And this is a completely different model in the sense that they are really being trained almost like opera stars to fulfill an expected role, aren't they? Yeah, I think it's absolutely fascinating. And I also, people who can do that kind of training and stick with it are not that kind of person and give up if things get hard. And that people are so dedicated, I think is really awe-inspiring. And then when you see the results on stage, and that's not to say that the K-pop industry is flawless or without its issues. Of course, it, it has problems. But when you see the results, it's just so awe-inspiring. Yeah. Were you a fan of K-pop before you wrote this book? I was. I've been into it not very long, actually, probably about three years or so. And I wrote it in part because I love it so much. It's so fun. And it really got me through the pandemic. So I really wanted to share that love with people, but also it's a huge industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. And I started getting into it and then I was just so boggled at the knowledge that this thing existed and I had no idea. I had no idea at all. A K-pop idol could have passed me on the street before I was into K-pop. Totally wouldn't have known. In the same way that like, I'm not super into a lot of sports, like a soccer player could pass me on the street and I, I wouldn't know. 
So I always think it's interesting that there's these huge areas of the world that I am so ignorant of and so many people are thrilled with and obsessed by. And when you start to discover that, it's just a fun, great feeling. Yeah. Did you say just then that it got you through the pandemic? Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Did you have it on your headphones when you were writing? Oh, yeah, How- all the time. So I have specific music that I do specific writing tasks to. And K-pop in itself, it's not a monolith, right? So there's more ballad music. There's more R&B styles. There's more rap styles. There's harder and softer, all like poppy or dancier. Whatever you want, whatever you're in the mood for, it's there. Um And I do not speak Korean. And of course, a lot of the lyrics are in Korean. So it's for me, I don't get distracted by the lyrics and stuff. I can just enjoy the beat and the music as I'm writing. But also because we couldn't go anywhere during the pandemic, I spent a lot of time with me and my laptop. So it was great to watch performances or watch the reality shows really helped give a mental break. It's interesting, you know, my anticipation would be that it was all that rather I sort of dance music. So to discover that it's quite a broad series of genres that are followed as well is news to me. Can you name a couple of bands that you really enjoyed? People might like to just have a listen. Of course. Yeah. In fact, if you go to my website, I have a kind of a starter boy band playlist. Oh, Um, great. A little more to the boy bands than the girl bands. Of course, BTS, I think probably everybody's heard of BTS by this point. They are fantastic. Other bands, there's, this is a band that I recently saw in concert. 17, I recently saw in concert. I think they're great. There's EXO and SHINee. They're just big bands, so many bands. That's great. I haven't seen it on your website, so we will point to that in the show notes for this episode. Yes, That's great. The stand-in, this is very much a story about the meeting of normal life and fame and what happens when somebody gets that kind of elevated status in a community. And the stand-in tackles that same topic from a slightly different angle. In that one, Gracie is lured into acting as a stand-in for a famous Chinese movie star so that the icon can have some private life and a break from public appearances. And she discovers both the advantages and the pitfalls of fame. Has this general theme of fame been something that fascinates you? Yeah, yeah. I think all the books in this series I've kind of mentally categorized as hidden hidden identity fame books, which are both things I really enjoy. But yeah, I do think fame and celebrity and how people react to it, how they institutionalize it, how we uh, kind of lift people up because they're famous is just fascinating. Like what makes someone famous and what doesn't? And what makes someone drop from fame or lose fame or gain fame? And what is fame? Fame versus infamy. I just think it's all very interesting, like how we as society kind of kind of look to that level. And I the reason I wrote the books as, I think you said, like a regular person meeting famous persons, I, I am not famous. I actually don't know what it's like to be a famous movie star. So I wanted my characters to explore that as an outsider looking into the fame rather than the famous person looking out. Uh-huh. Right. They look at identity in other ways too, because Ari is also realizing that she might be being treated differently because of her ethnicity, that she has this horrible moment really where she's challenged by the idea that she might have been, or somebody accuses her almost of being picked as a diversity choice, that she wouldn't have got the job unless she had the background that she had. And you get into that rather more in the comeback than the stand-in. The stand-in, it's there a little bit, but in the comeback, you seem to dig deeper Did you feel a little bit more confident about looking into that angle as you continued writing? I don't know if confidence is the word. I think more curious about it and the different ways we define identity and what it means and how we're perceived. When I was growing up, it wasn't something you really talked about, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It just, maybe people did. I don't know. But for me, it just wasn't something that people discussed. And again, I would hate to be like blanket statement. All Canadians didn't talk about this in the 1980s, whatever. But it hasn't really been to the last few years that I've really seen the vocabulary for these discussions change and increase. 
and people's comfort levels in talking about it change and increase. I think that could be partly reflected in the books is that I feel able to explore it more and articulate what I'm feeling and ideas that maybe I hadn't thought of more completely when I was younger. What do you think might have contributed to that opening up and that relaxing of some of the taboos? I think maybe people are more aware of it and I, that could be the media I consume, but it seems to me that people are more aware of identity and how it can impact a person's experiences or reality. And again, I'm not saying that these discussions didn't happen when I was younger. I'm sure they did, but it wasn't something I was really involved in. So maybe part of it is me changing and me being more open to those discussions where I might not have, I don't even know really. Is it society? Is it you? Is it a men of the two? I don't really know. Yeah, probably both. And it just plays off each other. It might have been more of an academic thing years ago. And it's migrated down more into popular media now, perhaps. Yeah. 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 That's actually a really interesting idea. I think I think that has a lot to it. And also social media didn't exist back then. I think even just now that I'm saying, I think having social media available means that we have more opportunities to talk about it yes. or to hear people talk about it. Sometimes you don't want to be part of the conversation, but you're learning from what other people are saying. Yes. Yeah. How did you get started in writing fiction? Was there a quotes light bulb moment and an epiphany when you thought, I really must write a book or I won't have met my purpose in life sort of thing. Was there any moment like that? <laughs> there, there, in fact, was. There was. So here in Toronto, we have a big book festival. It's called Word on the Street. And it's for authors and publishers and just people who love books. There's all these different stalls with people walking around, looking at books, buying books, talking about books. It's great. And in my 20s, I was walking around looking at books and I was thinking, wow, you know, this would be a cool idea, like to write this book, this particular book I was thinking. And then honestly, it just hit me I'm like, I could write that book. I could write that book. Like I'd always loved reading. Um, somehow it had not connected with me that people write those books and I could be one of those people. Like, I don't know. I think just in my head, writing was a totally different mental category than reading. And so when I had that realization. I really went home and started writing. And it was a terrible book. It's not very good. Oh, but it does have, like, the thing is, it was a bad book. My next book was a bad book. The book after that was, like, a bad book. Like, the next 10 were, like, slightly better books. But each book had a little something that made me think, like, oh, you know what? That bit, like, I like how I did that book. That, that little bit or that scene or that bit of dialogue or that word choice. I think I could try to do better on the next one. And the next one would have like another one that I like. So I'd, I'd keep trying until hopefully more of the book was bits I liked rather than bits I didn't like. Can you remember what that book was? No, you know, I, I remember the book I wrote, but it wasn't even, it was like I was looking at these books and thinking about this book idea. Oh, yeah. So the book I wrote, it was a sci-fi, it was cyber, cyberpunk sci-fi. And it's about like uh, an assassin. I still really love the concept, but I didn't know anything about plotting or anything. Like I just dove in and wrote it. But that character, I still like her. I still think she's cool. What were you reading yourself in those days? Cyberpunk sci-fi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so why aren't you writing cyberpunk sci-fi now? I actually did do a lot of paranormal writing and I read a lot of sci-fi. I still think it's an amazing genre. It's just I'm not super science-y, unfortunately. And I think, I actually, I don't think, I pretty much know that the book I wrote was really derivative of a book I was reading at the time. And so I think I fear if I, if I went back and tried another one, it would be, uh, be like, oh, that's like, that's like this author. And I'd be like, yeah, kind of is. But yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe I should. Maybe, maybe I'll, I will do another one. I do really like the genre. Yeah. It sounds like you have written a lot of books. Have they, have you published quite a few more books? I think on your website, you've mainly focused on these last two, haven't you? Yeah, there's honestly like 16 books on my laptop that went nowhere. It's just, I've been writing for over 20 years and I've tried on that laptop are, with a cyberpunk one, a couple of commercial fiction ones, a historical romance, a epic fantasy trilogy, a steampunk romance, some paranormal romances. There's just 
tons, right? Again, I, I know people who just woke up one day, they're like, I'm going to write a book. And that book was like an instant bestseller. And that was not me. Like I, I've been writing a really long time. And were those books published? Most of them were not. No, I used to write paranormal, but now I'm focusing on rom-coms. Yes. And would you be tempted to go back and look at those again and indie publish them? I do go back and look at them occasionally, but the reason they weren't published was for a reason. It was because most of them have like drastic flaws that would take so long to go back and correct that it's it's almost not worth it. Like I think mm -hmm. I'd rather focus on the books that I have contracted yes. out that I need to write. But there's definitely like, you know, that the historical romance and the steampunk romance. I still, I really like those books, so... It'd be great if they went somewhere, but right now I've got a lot on my plate. Yes. Did your work before you started writing help with your breakthrough? I mean, I'm not sure what you did do apart from, sounds like you spent an awful lot of time writing. But I'm thinking really in terms of your interest in social media and the way that it works in our world. Yeah. yeah. So I was in communications for about 20, 20 years. So I would, yeah, I do think it influenced a lot. There's just a lot of writing. There's a lot of monitoring. There's a lot of seeing what's happening. There's a lot of looking at reactions to things. So it, it helps me in a lot of ways because I do um, try to look at things critically because when you're in communications, you need to look at everything critically because you're looking at, well, where could things go wrong that I'm going to have to do some work? So you're always looking at worst case scenarios, which means you have to look at every situation and be like, okay, what could happen here? What could happen here? which is a great thing for book writing because when you're plotting, you also have to think about what could happen here. And if that person says that, then what happens and work through the, those plots. Yeah. Ari in The Comeback, she, although she's a lawyer, she gets into that area a lot, doesn't she? Because she's working with clients who she has to help with the risk management when things go wrong. And even with the Jehoon character, once he is outed as to who he is and has to go back and face his stardom life. There's a whole lot of really interesting stuff about the impact of public opinion on careers and things. It's like being in PR, really, what you have to cover there. It's really interesting. You mentioned about looking at risk management and plots. That indicates to me that you might be one of those people who the plot unfolds as you write and that do you do very much outlining and forward planning with the plot line? I don't. So I usually work off of my proposals. So I work off an outline, but it's more of a narrative outline because I like to explore the book as I'm writing it. I'm not yes. great at plotting. And even when I have tried plotting, I usually end up way over here anyway. So I'm like, well, <laughs> I've just wasted a week plotting. And now I'm like, I'm in a completely different direction because just stuff occurs to you as you're, as you're writing. I would like to be a better plotter. I would like to be a better outliner. I think that would save me so much time and so much agony, I think it would be excellent. And I'm trying to get there, but I'm not great at it. <laughs> That's wonderful. Look, I noticed that both books were published as audio books before they were published in either ebook or paper form. And that was quite a new thing to me. I hadn't heard of that being done that often. Is that common in Canada? And how was that proposed to you? No, yeah. My books come out first as an Audible original. So Audible has a an audiobook studio where they do audiobooks. It's pretty straightforward. So when my book went to auction, we decided to go to Audible, but we also wanted the book out in print. So we, my agent, who's brilliant, just created a dual deal. So the audio goes out and then the print will go out a few months later. I don't know anyone else with the same deal with me. I think I think it's still fairly unusual. I don't know for certain. There could be a ton of people out there with the same deal, but I'm the only one I know of. So if anyone knows of anyone else, just tell me and then I can correct myself. But <laughs> it's still, it, I think it is quite unusual still. Yeah, I thought that was so. Have you, are you finding that it's working well? I mean, you've been, you were top of the Audible list for the last two years with your books. So they're obviously breaking through there. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, actually. Like, I like audiobooks myself. I know in some areas there's still debate over our audiobooks reading. I am totally in team reading. I think audiobooks are great for people who are busy or have trouble reading for whatever reason. I know I myself go through, especially in the last couple of years, it's been really hard for me to focus on books, like really hard. And I miss that. And I found that audiobooks have really helped me because I can put them on in the background, I'm doing stuff. So I'm still like cooking or whatever, but I'm still listening to the books. I'm 
able to scratch that itch that way when my focus on the written word has been just so hard to control lately. Do you think that's part of the results of the pandemic? I've had other authors say exactly yeah. the same oh, thing yeah. to me. Mm. Yes, I absolutely think it is. I think I started being on my phone a lot more. I started consuming media in much smaller bites. I also started reading more ebooks because I couldn't go to the bookstore and actually buy mm -hmm. a physical book. Mm -hmm. And then also my husband said I had too many books because they were over like, all her bookshelves. <laughs> and then, I, but once the book's on my phone, and notif notifications are coming down on other stuff. And I'm like, doom, 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 like, uh, like a hummingbird, right? So I've been trying to retrain myself back to physical books. Um, and it has been a struggle. Like, it has absolutely been uh, a struggle. And I'm not happy with the situation at all. Mm. Look, just turning to the subject of reading, because this is binge reading, we do like to ask our authors what they're reading if they have been a binge reader in the past or even now and what they'd recommend so just briefly what would you recommend to people from anything you've read over the last few years really oh gosh okay so as I said I was having trouble getting back into books and I thought mm. you know what like I'd been struggling with like new reads and I thought that's it I'm going back to a comfort read and I'm going back to a comfort read with a lot of content so I went back to Nalini Singh's Guild uh -huh. Hunter series uh -huh. um, about dear read. Kiwi writers. Yep. Hadn't read in a while. And then I was like, oh, and she's got more books on it too. So that was great. So I read, I think, I don't know, eight of those, nine of those in a row, which was great. And then in general, when I'm writing rom-coms, I tend to stay away from rom-coms. But Amy Lee came out with X's and O's and it's just a really fun, oh, it's so fun. Like it's the second in her series. The first one is about her sis, the main character sister. And X's and O's is about a romance book obsessed woman who decides to track down all her old exes with the help of her super hot like I think he's a firefighter roommate and it's just it's really fun and she's also Canadian which is great oh, it sounds fun it does sound fun <laughs> that's great looking back over your writing career is there anything now that you'd change if you had the opportunity to or are you really very happy with the way it's all developed I mean like, there's probably stuff I would change but I don't I think things happen the way they happened to get me to this point so I'm gonna have to go with no I think everything happened for a reason would I have liked to get this point a lot sooner yes would yes. it have happened had things changed no there it is yeah so tell us a little bit about your schedule for the next 12 months you, you mentioned that you've got a very full desk what have you got to look forward to in the next 12 months well, I just finished the edits on The Takedown, which is the, my third book, like after the comeback and, and the stand-in. So those edits went in yesterday, actually. I'm writing a book called Bottled Up, which is about a, it's not a rom-com, but it's about a family of ancient Chinese witches who can change emotions with perfume. And another book just got announced that I'll be writing, and it's about, it's a rom-com about an obituary writer. A, so I say that again, an obituary writer. Obituary writer. Oh, great. No. The Takedown, that's another hidden identity book, is it? Yes, but I don't want to say any more. No, about, that's It's fine. about a diversity consultant who it takes on a job in luxury fashion. Oh, that sounds real fun. I tell you who I've just interviewed again last week, and that's Roselle Lim. When you're talking about Magical Witches. I mean, yes. her latest, the Sophie Go book. I've got a second little sort of sideline. I do a program called Encore, which is authors that have already been on the show coming back for a slightly shorter segment with their latest book. And we talked to Roselle back in about February 2020, and her episode became one of the most listened to of that year. It made the best of the year. So we had a back this time with Sophie Go, and once again, that magical realism aspect of her work is a great deal of fun. Yeah, her writing is just lovely, just really beautiful, real fun. So do you enjoy interacting with your readers and where can they find you online? I do. You can find me mostly on Instagram and the it's at Lily Chu Author. I am on Twitter, but I'm not actually on Twitter. So there, there's... Twitter up there, but I'm, I don't check it. I don't go on it. I think I'm about to take it off my phone completely. There's no point in seeing me there. And then you go to my website, lilychuauthor.com. And my, that's probably it. I'm not super social media-y. You're not a TikTok gal. 
I love to lurk on TikTok, but again, going back to trying to train myself off consuming small bite media, I'm really trying to reduce the amount of time I'm looking at dance challenges and what I eat in a day as a whatever, which are my favoriteest things. For some reason, I get a lot of sheep shearing. Probably the reason is probably I, I watch them and I find that so soothing. It's so <laughs> soothing to me. And just like how they can shear the sheep. It's just, it's really mind blowing. <laughs> That's just lovely, Lily. Look, thank you so much. It's been a delight to talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed today's show, why not leave us a recommendation on your favourite podcast site so that others will find us too? Word of mouth is the best recommendation we can have. That's it for today. Binge Reading will be back in two weeks on April the 1st, talking to a Canadian living in France, Samantha Berant. She writes culinary romances with food at the heart of the story, and her latest is The Spice Master at Bistro Exotique. A talented chef discovers how spices and scents can transport her to other realms, and more importantly, how self confidence can unlock the greatest magic of all love in this perfectly seasoned new novel from a master storyteller. That's next week. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. Happy reading and see you next time. That's just lovely, Lily. Look, thank you so much. It's been a delight to talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed today's show, why not leave us a recommendation on your favourite podcast site so that others will find us too. Word of mouth is the best recommendation we can have. That's it for today. Binge Reading will be back in two weeks on April the 1st, talking to a Canadian living in France, Samantha Berant. She writes culinary romances with food at the heart of the story, and her latest is The Spice Master at Bistro Exotique. A talented chef discovers how spices and scents can transport her to other realms and, more importantly, how self-confidence can unlock the greatest magic of all, love, in this perfectly seasoned new novel from a master storyteller. That's next week. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. Happy reading and see you next time.